Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So today I want to give a special shio on the current parshas, this week's and next week's, which give us details of the ten plagues. And you'll see, you'll see on this chart, which I want each one of you to have a copy. Mitzrayim, Egypt, to destruction, and Pharaoh to recognize the power of Hashem <coughs> has a deep structure. There have been great numbers of excavations in Egypt, and amongst them, the Egyptian descriptions of the Ten Plagues, especially the, what's called the Ipoa Papyrus, discovered quite some time ago, and more recently, more excavations have shown how the largest empire in, in the world altogether at that time was Mitzrayim, Egypt, and it collapsed on the count of the ten plagues. I just saw uh, a few days ago <coughs> that um, there's a friend of mine, in fact, in London, who takes groups on a tour of Egyptian excavations at the British Museum, British Library, where there are also many remnants. I have an email with uh, the leading Egyptologist who has found dozens of confirmations of the truth of the details mentioned in the Humash through Emmet Meir and Titzmach, how truth springs from the earth. So we know in the chapter 5 of the Ethics of the Fathers, our sages analyzing the Chumash say the world was created in ten days. Because it says ten times by Yomel, which means a mama, a saying of God, that brought the world into existence. It means Ma'amar, as we often describe, in contrast to Medabel, the Debo, is <coughs> the inner meaning. In other words, it was a machshava in thought. God had a thought to create the world and it came to existence. The mission says there were ten things, because Bereshit, the beginning, is also a saying. Bereshit really means there was a beginning. Today they call it the singularity. Don't know where it comes from. But we, from science we can prove there was a certain point when time began and space began. No. We all know that the creation represents the concept of ten. And we all know the Aseris Adibrot, the Decalogue, which is the basis also of moral civilization, was revealed at Sinai in ten sayings. 
Ten Commandments. We can say the difference in Mama and Dibo. Mama is expression of thought, Dibo is singular form of Dibrot, <coughs> precise declaration in words. While the Mama expressed the intention God had in mind in creating the world on ten levels, so also in the Asseris Hadibras, the ten words or declarations God revealed to anyone who would listen, ideally the whole of mankind, also in ten declarations, and only Amisra consented to go and apply the real intention of the world in life. I'll add to this that the sages say, Zahar was given to the nations of the world. Shammah was only given to the people of Israel. And that's why in the first version of the Asera Tadib wrote it Zahar. What does this mean? <coughs> that the concept to remind oneself that God is the constant creator is essential as the basis of the Nohad Code. All the other mitzvot in the Ten Sayings, they're all included one way or another under what we know as the mitzvot b'nei Noach, the Nohad Code. But the cont, and also therefore we say, the, it's very interesting, the characteristic of the people of Israel is the observance of Shabbat, which is Shamor, means to observe, to keep all the laws of Shabbat. And the people of Israel are even called, in some texts, Amma Shabbat, the people of the Shabbat. I say this in particular because of the present crisis in Israel, when a large section of the nation say, the Shabbat is the essence of the people of Israel and also is essential if we're going to have a Jewish state, if the state will really be Jewish. And this is not only because of its religious aspect, also because of its social aspect. And in fact, it's very interesting where there was a debate in the Knesset mm -hmm. recently it wasn't uh, one of the religious members of the Knesset who said we've got to keep the Shabbat socially. And there's so many businesses, different opening Shabbat, new canyons and so on. And they say that this is a social injustice. And there are very many Jews in Israel who obviously would much prefer to have the Shabbat free for their family, <coughs> for station. But some of them also want some of them want to go to synagogue, and some not. But they say we can only make ends meet and were paid more by many different businesses on the Shabbat. And therefore they succumb. You know, like happened where everyone knows, when the Jews came from Eastern Europe to America, a regular story, when first very many of them came at one time, of course they needed to get jobs. So those who wanted to keep Shabbat, they took a job on Monday. When it came to Friday, they would say, well, you've got to come tomorrow. They said, I can't come tomorrow. They lost their job. They had to go to search. Many, of course, gave in. And we're having a similar situation here now. Same situation. Very difficult. 
So what do we find? Why do we mention this? When Am Yisrael went out from Egypt, so you can say the Egyptian empire collapsed and the remnant collapsed entirely and the miracle of the splitting of the sea which mitzvah were the Jewish people asked to keep first, even before the Aseret Which one? No, no, Shabbat. Shabbat. In Shabbat itself, just after the description of the splitting the sea, <coughs> then we have the Pasha Dhamon. The Mon fell, they had no food, the Mon fell. And together with the Mon falling, they were given laws concerning observing Shabbat, not working Shabbat, not going, not, not going out even to collect the portion. And if they, if they took the, they went out, <coughs> they, they, they were given the double portion on Friday to, to last them for Shabbat. So this comes even before the Aserat Adibrat. Then the Aserat Adibrat were offered, the Torah was offered to all the nations. That's what is given in Sina, before we come to the land of Israel. So the sages say that the Pasuk, remember the day of the Shabbat, to keep it holy, that verse was given to the nations also. If the nations would have accepted it, they wouldn't need the next verse, which says you shouldn't do any work. <coughs> in fact, we say Gentiles, if they're going to accept the prohibition of work on Shabbat, they shouldn't do it because this is the basis of the Jewish practice, the Jewish way of life. They either commit themselves to become part and parcel of the Jewish people, in which case they have to keep the Shabbat, and if not, they, can, they should keep Zachor. In other words, you've got to remember the, the, the Creator, and maybe you could even have a day of rest, but the day of rest shouldn't be with the specific aspect of prohibition of work, because prohibition of the different types of malacha, some of them, have, they're not even contradiction to resting. Many bits today, of course, you can you can have a good day of rest and transgress, travel a car, and uh, use a telephone. It can, in so many different prohibitions, you can transgress and have a good rest on Shabbat. Because the, the aspect, the social aspect of having a day of rest and not being enslaved to work, and there's no person employing people who's permitted to give them back-breaking work seven days a week, sometimes 12 hours a day and so on. No, so I don't want human beings to live like that. And that's why the Shabbat is mentioned right at the beginning of Chumash. So, but the, but the, so the other words, the Decalogue, otherwise, is geared to Mitzvot B'nai Noach. And that explains all the distinctions also between the way it's described in the Vayet Hanan, where it says, Shamor et Yom Shabbat Kacho, you've got to observe the Shabbat, that applies to the Jewish people. Because we've got a higher aspect, we've got a higher level, we've priestly people. <coughs> so, that is. We have there the concept of ten, and let me explain what ten signifies. We have been given ten fingers and ten toes, because man is created in the image of God. What does it mean? That even the body of the human being has attached to it spiritual basic concepts. Just like the human being, is for the right hand, which is more active, the left hand, which is more passive. And all this, each hand has different fingers. 
which represent the different types of activities, especially of a creative nature, on which the human being is capable of using or, or abusing. And the person who wants to use his body in the right manner, then he has to harmonize all the different creative pa talents that he's been given. Not that one should contradict the other. There's going to be a balance. The balance between right and left, the concept of right, even in most languages, is connected with that which is right and correct. To do things in the right manner. The left <coughs> is more relative. <coughs> so in Hebrew, the left is called some <coughs> some a <coughs> <coughs> the poison of God. <coughs> the power of being destructive. <coughs> the poison of God <coughs> you find in the natural world. Natural world is all creation of Hashem. Created <coughs> in an allegorical anthropomorphical man, as it's called. <coughs> Which means, <coughs> the Torah speaks in the language of man in order that he should understand the activity of God. <coughs> Why does God create in the plant world, for example? He creates such productive trees and plants that produce beautiful flowers and beautiful fruit, tasty fruit, and such good sustenance amongst all the vegetables. So why does he create other vegetables that are poisonous? There's so many poisonous plants and poisonous fruits. The answer is, we require that you create the right balance. The scientists will tell you that that's the right balance. Why the right balance? Because we need poisons to heal sickness. Most of the poisons in the world are extremely valuable, you know, for healing purposes. Some of them are valuable to go and destroy negative vermin spread all over the world. And the poison destroys them. There's an interaction constantly, construction and destruction. The purpose is construction, but when things don't go the right way, you need to have destruction. The same applies. We be given a right hand, a left hand. The right is constructive, the left hand is destructive. Because we don't know when to say no against all evils. It's a very quick reply today, very simply. It's, uh, it's one of the <clears throat> aspects of morality that's not understood sufficiently. If we want to have peace for any society, you can only establish peace if you eliminate those aspects of human society that are dedicated to war instead of to peace, as an end in itself. They're dedicated to hate instead of to love. They're dedicated to criminality in all areas, to destroy families, to destroy people's possessions, to destroy human rights. We've got to stop it. Otherwise, there'll be no human rights left. There'll be no human species left. And today, it's become a real worldwide problem. So we have to have the right and the left, in the, in the Torah sense. So the concept of ten is as follows, and in, it's very significant that we can best understand and analyze the concepts of the Torah through the knowledge of Hebrew. Hebrew 
some say, sages say, some take it literally, some take it symbolically, the world was created in the Hebrew language. So let's take the word for ten. What's the word for ten in yes. Hebrew? Yes. 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 So, Esso, couldn't do as a unit. <coughs> Units of ten, accepted in mathematics. But also accepted as units in the Torah. Many. Many. In many different aspects. But what is it? It's, in the Torah, it's a unit where the different individual digits or the different individual fingers, they work together. <coughs> and also in a moral sense, the powers of production and creativity, which are all positive, they're not disturbed through abuse from the left side. Destructive. Destructive is important, as we just explained. When a person is very sick, and sometimes you have to bring people in a lot of pain, and sometimes even you've got to cut out certain parts, the skin of the body, whatever it is, in order they should be able to live. You have to sometimes make an operation to keep a person alive and let him go and be creative. And that applies in all areas of life. So the ten represents harmonizing the two. That the right should always be the one that is the true might. And we only use the left hand to preserve the right hand. But the sages say this way, also let us say in influencing other people. The sages say, Yemin your right hand always has to work hard to bring people near to saintliness, near to Hashem, near to positive approach to life and to themselves also. And the left has to be used to keep away, to keep away the negative influences. So this is the concept which of harmony, the Esa harmonize everything, and therefore the word Esa, in the Hebrew language, there's a close connection with this one letter, the Sheen letter. It depends where the dot is on the right hand, what is it? How do you pronounce it? Sheen. When it's on the left hand, a seen. They're connected. And therefore the sages say, you want to become rich? You want to be a rich person, really rich. You will not do it by wanting to use everything you have for your own wealth. You've got to give away a tenth. I would give away a part, and that would preserve the rest for you. But a person who said, I'm not going to give myself, I'm not giving to others. Oh, then the, perhaps you, you've really earned all the money. You worked very hard to get it. Then we say, it's mine to do with whatever I want. No one's going to tell me, well, I've got to give, I've got a duty to give to charity. Because whatever I've got, I want to become rich. Very rich man. The sages, oh no. That wealth would be destructive. And that's the truth. The, the, the multi-millionaires who don't want to give to charity, they become miserly. They want all for themselves and give nothing to anybody else. It destroys their character. So they would say, just say, you want, you want true wealth. Ezeo Ashir hasameach bechelko. You got to be happy with a portion that Hashem has given. He's given you a portion. He hasn't given you the totality. He hasn't directly given you the top place in the Forbes list to stay there non-stop. No. And I tell you this: there's a, there's, it's, it's getting through a bit. Some of the greatest millionaires in the world. How come that uh, Bill Gates, he's decided to give, I think, you know better, 99? 
or 999 of every, the all his assets to charity. Yeah? They realize, I'm going to become, uh, I'm going to become, there was once a millionaire called Hughes, who was the richest man in the world, some, many decades ago. And he, he, he couldn't live anywhere because people were all after him to get his, get his wealth in different ways. So he used to rent penthouses on top of hotels. And he had to go from one penthouse to the next, sometimes switching <coughs> every week, because then one would know where he was. And, and I, I, I knew a certain Jewish millionaire, you know, Maxwell, which is something you might know. He, he became very, very rich. And what happened to him? It's a big tragedy, you know. He, got, he, had, he had his own yacht. And he jumped out of the yacht into yeah, the Robert, sea. Robert Maxwell. Huh? Robert Maxwell. Huh? Robert Maxwell. Don't hear Maxwell. Yeah. yeah. I knew him. I had talks with him so before. He was the Czech was he, was, he helped the yeah, Shiva. He was a family too. So yeah. Anyway, this is what happens to me. So how do you, how do you become happy? So I may have Now this is furthermore. In Hebrew, there's a relationship between Ayin and Aleph. The ayin should really be another ayin, the gatro. And the aleph is really a stop, it's not really a proper consonant. But still, if you study the Hebrew language carefully, you see ayin and ayin are related. So therefore, ashia, a rich person, is the same letters as asara. So the source of wealth is ten. So this part of the situation, why? Why was this code given in ten words? And even until today, the ten commandments, as they're called. We said more commands, but in any case, it's ten, ten declarations. So the answer is, because this is the road to happiness, to reach Osha. And it's shown in the human being, the structure of the human being. So, to take this a step further, they therefore say, the question is, Hashem said, or the world I've created in this manner, in order to bring society to a life of peace and, and, and keeping the right balance and let the, those who have look after the have-nots, all these concepts, and which are contained, if you look more deeply, in the Noahide Code, I want all mankind to come to this. But uh, what happened was, the Noah wanted to bring this to the human <coughs> mankind. It was revealed by Hashem, to him, it was written the Chumash. And mankind didn't follow until Avram Avinu came. And Avram, Avram Avinu was given the blessing, through him would bless all the families of earth. But when was that blessing made more concrete? When the Jewish people were sent to slavery, why were sent to slavery? Why does Hashem want to be slaves first? For this reason, same reason. We've got to feel what it's like to be at the bottom level of human beings and human societies that abuse through the power of destruction, the freedom that's given to human beings, they go and abuse it. And in that is if, if, the, if the culture and the concepts of Egyptian society led by Pharaoh, who is like a, a, a personification, the Pharaoh's were a personification of that which is wise and evil, and where the strong ones will bring their iron rule over the weak ones, and people will be subjected to to, to murder, to rape, to, to, to incest, all sorts of corruptions connected with idolatry. And they make themselves into the eye of living. Man, they, man, man is God. So how do we change society? So what does Hashem do? He made, he especially sent us to Egypt, but this corruption was at its strongest point in Egyptian society. And there, there, we had to learn the lesson of what it's like, the school of suffering. In all, we will learn the lesson 
that we should always use whatever we got to help those who don't have. Which is, uh, which is the basic lesson of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, of the region. So in order to bring even the non-Jewish world to recognize this, Hashem brought ten plagues. Now, I, now we, can go, we could go into a detailed analysis, but I'll take a good few shiura, how the ten plagues correspond to the ten sayings and correspond to the ten words of the Aserat Adibra. But that means a deep investigation, seeing all the nuances of what is described in the Chumash in a few chapters, the ten plagues. But the concept is, in order to lead us from the level of the world and man of creation to the level where man fulfills the word of God, we have the ten plagues that demonstrate the hands of God in a figurative way. So when the Egyptians are plagued by the lice, the khartumim, by the way, khartumim comes from the root to engrave. The khartumim, that their own secret language, magical language of hieroglyphics. And they were the ones who use magic. The magic, if you follow the Rambam, had no reality, but they did have a lot of scientific knowledge to, to create different appearances that would give them their elite group power over the vast majority, of the thousands, hundreds and thousands of citizens. They should know they've been ruled by the by Parra and his group, who had great, great wisdom. So you can see even on today, many people have, have investigated, but all the secrets of the pyramids have, and have not yet been explained completely. So, but still, but many things we recognize today is a very high level of scientific knowledge and also a great knowledge of astronomy. So, so when, they, when we find in the Chumash, the Khatumim, they acknowledge what they say is a finger of God. That's the word they use. One finger, one plate, two. It's described. Ten plates are the hands of God, the right hand, the left hand. By means of this, the, the people of Israel at least recognize that God brought to mankind the idea that man must be a partner who brings the ma'amar, the salam amarot, the intention of Hashem, the purpose of Hashem in creating the world, into a debo, a declaration, a declaration which gives a guideline how to live. So I think this, uh, this, is, this concept of the Ten Plagues. Now, even the Decalogue, how does it begin? What's the first declaration of the Decalogue? Anochi. What, what say it in full? I am Hashem your God. How does it go on? Took you out the land of Egypt. Took you out the land of Egypt. I took you out from the land of Egypt, from the, the you can say, the house of bondage. That means Egypt, as far as you were concerned, was a prison. Prison. But if you were the lowest level of society, you were in prison. A prison where you're being killed as well, and where you're being tortured. That's what it was, beat up I did. I took you out from there. So the question arises, the famous question, also put in the, in the, in the fantastic uh, production of Luda Levi, called the Kuzarim, where the, the Kuzarim were a non-Jewish group, and the king and some of the people in his palace and his family, they wanted to find out the truth. The truth of how to live. And he had a constant dream. He wanted to find 
truth, he was told in the dream, your intentions are very good, but your actions are not good enough. That came in his dream. So he decided he's going to call all the philosophers, philosophers and greatest thinkers of his time. So he called, brought a Greek philosopher, a person trained in philosophy. It's going back, well, I think, for one, one and a half thousand years ago. So he had no discussions. It's, 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 there's a lot of historical proof there was such a movement. And they all became proselytes, a whole group of this the Ural Mountains called the Kuzari. <coughs> so so he, he called a philosopher, he called a, an, an Islam scholar, then he called a scholar of the Christians. But Islam and the Christians, and even some of the Greeks, they said, well, you know, Jewish wisdom is of great value. So he called the Jew as well. And then this one of the questions which he asked him, or just both the Christian and the Muslim spoke about the Ten Commandments. So I asked the question, why if Hashem revealed himself to mankind, surely you'd say, I am I am God who created you. Why did he say that? So the answer is that, okay, creation we can work out from the text, and we can work out from um, also certain ancient text today we can work it out scientifically the world must have had a beginning how can it begin we come to the speculation but we weren't actually human beings who not, did not actually witness the creation because everything was created before man even man himself didn't witness creation he saw himself he came into the world so the, the only creation which uh, Adam witnessed was what? Which act of creation did Adam Arishan witness? <coughs> creation of his wife. Yeah, that he witnessed. So really, really to, to sleep. Adam, Adam is the pinnacle of creation, the highest level. So if it's a pinnacle that goes upwards, which it does, if you look at the Chumash, that means Creation of the woman is the top. And said, Lord Tav here, it's not good that man should be alone. Otherwise, goodness, ultimately, can only come if a man gets a wife. She's the source of goodness. That's it. That's, that's the, if, you, if you follow the way of the Torah, the greatest goodness in the world is a good wife. So, <laughs> those who don't have such a situation yet, which was a shame to bless you all. Amen. Experiences. So, so, so this is it. That the, the concept was a show tzitira meret misraim. That is what's mentioned, introduced as said of the Libra. Because well, that's history. That's something which was experienced. And although later generations will say, well, how do you know it happened? So we say, got a record. But it isn't a record. Why does it say constantly in the Torah, you have to remember every detail of the Exodus from Egypt? Because that's the basis of historical consciousness. And history is something which experienced. So the the um, the concept of the historical experience, and today let's say they were in a fortunate situation. We are far much farther removed from from the Egyptian plagues and from the Decalogue which followed. <coughs> we are removed from it for thousands of years. But it remains with us in the historical memory of the Jewish people and it's the basis of our right on Eretz Israel. Well, it's related. And we've got this historical past. And that's why, it's, it's, it's because it's so important. And mankind, not only we, the mankind have learned from us. Most of the freedom movements in the world, the want to 
remove tyrants, despots. They're inspired and they get guidance from what it says in the Bible. So, this explains to us that Hashem revealed his, his, within, in the Ten Plagues, we have to reach the level when, you would, when, when not only the Egyptians should change and Paro should change, and we see that gradually he began to recognize he can't deny the existence of God, and also he can't deny the special role of the people of Israel. So this should motivate us. So God brought revelation of his power over nature and over man, and revealed his choice of Am Yisrael through the plagues. He smote the Egyptians with his two hands, as it were, metaphorically. Each plague represents one of the fingers of God, demanding that we should return to him through Teshuva. Vidatem ki ani Hashem is mentioned ten times with the plagues. There are different ways of knowing Hashem, experiencing him. They are all described in the ten plagues. Each plague will have one of God's fingers. Fingers represent the recognition that everything that's happening in the world is directed by God. Now you've got charts in front of you. So what are these charts in front of us? This is a chart of the ten plagues. Here, I'll give it to uh, those who don't have, take one of these. Thank you. And, and you said earlier that... The no. What do we do? We were speaking about each of the plagues. The Seder night, when we recite these plagues, what do we do? You take out the finger of the, of the you also have a small spoon, represent extension of the finger for each plate. You represent each plate of significance. And then the Haggadah Pesach continues with a siman, a mnemonic of Rabbi Huda. Do any of you know what's that mnemonic? Concerns the ten plates. <coughs> the tzach adash be'achav. What significant the siman is as follows. He summarizes the groups of the plagues by the initials. The tzach damtze v'dekinim, adash alav devashchin, v'achav, barad, ar v'choshe, v'dev b'cholot. We take, we take additional drops of wine out of the cup for each one of these three groups. So let's see, what's the deepest significance of Abdullah's grouping the plates in three sets? So now, if you, if you look at the chart, you'll see, okay, what I've done here, this chart, is in order to understand, you just read one plague after the other, there's an underlying structure here, which is described by the commentaries. <clears throat> so I'm not going to mention this, you'll see here, many different commentaries I quote, there's Malbim, Sephono, Ababana, Ramban, Alshir, Rav Hirsch, but the more important thing is to understand the structure. Each plague has an introduction, a warning. And actually, you, you see, you look at this chart, that um, the the threefold division, the Tzach Adash Be'achav, that the first two have a warning, the third one is without a warning. So the first is blood, frogs, and lice. It says in the Chumash, lice came without warning. 
The first two with warnings. The same the next three. A row of wild animals. They have a, 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 a deadly plague. That has a warning. But boils, shrin, no warning. Then we have barat, hail, arbi locust, choshek, darkness. So also, the first two with warning, the last without warning. First, let me explain this. It says at the beginning of the plague that there are two things which are mentioned as being a description of the plague. It's either called an ot, ot means a sign, or it's called the Mofet. Today we use the word Mofet for a miracle. It's like a net. Mofet is, is a... Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that comes to the person as clear, <sighs> supernatural suddenness. It's a Mofet is a with pit from sudden. It's something that comes sudden, which is unexpected. Unexpected from the point of view of the natural regularity of our environment and of nature, and comes suddenly. And this, this is how we can describe them. The first two are signs. They're signs of the truth of the statement because they're, they're preceded by a warning. Moshe Aaron have to come to Paro and warn him. If you let the people go, the constant request is Shalach et Hamivi Abduli. You, Paro, you've taken, the, you've abused these people, you've told lies about them, spread terrible propaganda, which is false. You've made yourself into a god, think, because you go to the Nile in the morning and uh, you identify yourself with the Nile as a god. Therefore, you're going to <laughs> make sure that no religious ideas which come from these people, from this Moshe. In fact, that Moshe, it turns out, well, he, he, he didn't realize the problem until the course of the events that in his palace itself, this Moshe was um, developed, grew up in his palace. And he was a result, to some extent, of his big power, of the decree he brought to drown all the Jews. <coughs> anyway. anyway, so the plagues come with signs which warn him, more fed without warning, suddenly. So, what I put here at the top, that many of the plagues, the, fir the first one in each one, Sometimes it's the second, no, the second one also. It all says go to Paro. Number one, two, number one, two, number one, two, and all three is Boy Paro. Go to Paro. Now, in the morning, early in the morning, it only says by the first one in each group. Why? That is Paro. If you look at if you, if you take the, all the passages in the Tanakh concerning Paro, he went in the morning to the Nile, ostensibly because he identified himself with the Nile. He said the Nile is a god. To the Egyptians it was a god. And and I'm a god. And I I am I'm a partial God connected with the Nile. That's why we went every day in the morning to the Nile to bring that identification. You even find this in the dreams, also it says that Paolo was on the Nile. Because in his, in his image, he was the God of the Nile and the God of the world. And he was a self-made God. That's how it's described in Yechezka. So he went to the Nile in the morning. The sages say, because he made himself a god, and a god does not need to see to his natural needs, so he made out 
when he see it naturally, he went to the night privately. It was to see to his natural needs. And to the people he made out he is above nature. I told you he's the God of the world. So therefore, to be at the morning at the riverside, that's only mentioned by the first one of each set. <coughs> but the second one was a continuation to some extent. The second one was good enough. The message that came each time to him to warn him he said, Shalaf et Amir we have done it. Let my people go so that it will serve me. Now this is also important for us to know. The motto, let my people go, has been used frequently in history whenever people have been under enslavement. And this was led to the constant motto used for the communists. The communists who didn't allow Jews out it was the Iron Curtain. So all organizations wanted to free their motto is, let my people go. But they did not add the important phrase we have done it. They took the motto from the Bible. But the Bible is, let my people go. Why are they my people? Because they're the ones, they are on a subjection, because they've got to learn to t teach mankind, to be a kingdom of priests. So let them go, to serve me. To serve, when they serve, to serve me, I want them to come to get the revelation of Sinai. To recognize that they've got to get out of Egypt and become my servants, and thereby gain true freedom and spread true freedom in the world. <coughs> so this explains um, the concept of the whole purpose was to bring the Paro, to let the people go and to change him, and thereby also to change some of the concepts in the Egyptian lifestyle, that there was a God higher than Paro, and that God demands recognition that these people are going to be the representative of God in this world. Now, the most significant is here what I call the Mount Tadar, in order to know. Because the purpose of the plague was to make it known, to make known principles of faith. The first group, it says, the expression is, to make known what? To make known that the man Teda, Kiani Hashem, that God exists. You say there's no God in the world. Yes, I'm God. <coughs> God, I'm the power in the world. The second group is further. The people who say, what? What do I accept God? God is up in the heavens. And God, if you say God is up in the heavens, he's beyond everything. He doesn't care what goes on, on this spot, little spot in the wide universe. The globe is just a small spot. New beings want it like, like, like insects. You expect God to be concerned about what goes on in the world. So God is one. Not only is he the creator, but he, Ani Hashem of I am God in the midst of the earth, and I know what's going on, and I control it. And the third one, he ain't kamori b'cholares. You might say, okay, so this God, this God, he has certain interest also, has some partial control in the world, but there are other powers in the world. There's God in the world, and then there's other powers, the power of nature, the power of the, the four energies today, today, even people, scientists, who the greatest scientists, who recognize that science gives us an understanding of the mind of God. But they've got a riddle. They say we analyze the forces, there, there's the weak and the strong nuclear force, and there's the force of electromagnetism, and there's the force of the mass and velocity. So these four forces, these are four forces, independent of God. 
That's what that's what, that's what uh, Steve Hawkins said. But still, you know, they haven't. They, no, ain't harmony. There's, there's no power like me. I'm the ultimate absolute power of everything, and you have to recognize it. And of course, then comes, then comes the final, the final blade. Where also he was given, he was given a detailed warning exactly when he, when Hashem would come in the middle of the night, and he would kill all the first ones, the Egyptians, and Pharaoh didn't take notice, but. You've got to rec you be forced to recognize that he has chosen the people of Israel to come out from enslavement in Egypt to become the people of Hashem. And therefore there it says, Hashem is making this distinction. All the houses of the Egyptians, the firstborn, that means the people who are so-called the cultural leaders of their idolatrous lifetime will be eliminated. After what's happened. But the Am Israel would be redeemed. Amen. Now, now on the, I've put, there's a lot more on this. And I, I, I put a copy of a, a longer description. But I can make a few copies for you if you're interested. Or I can give another shield on it if you're interested. Yeah, for sure. We need yeah. more. This is very important. You said before that this is the basis of what? It's the basis of something. The ten plagues, the basis of the of the Decalogue. No, after that. Siat Mitzrayim is the basis of the of the to get out from enslavement to the lower levels of mankind, to reach the level of being a priestly people, to change the world. Today's English day is the tenth. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. So I'll continue this year tomorrow. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry.